crypto people think it's all about crypto and it's regulators and it's FTX. It's not none of that. It's liquidity mm -hmm. was taken out of the system. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. And we've got the asset that moves most according to liquidity. Mm -hmm. So when liquidity comes out, it falls a lot. When liquidity comes in, it rises even more because there's yeah. a secular uptrend. So how I look at crypto is if you take the log chart of crypto, which everybody, uh, Bitcoin, which everybody's looking at, yeah, I mean, you know, you use that and it goes in these big cycles. And those big cycles are the monetary cycles, liquidity cycles. Yeah. But it's still always going up. Real Vision CEO Raul Pal gives us his prediction and outlook for crypto in the next few months, as well as what's playing a crucial role in the market's fluctuations and causing prices to fall. Pal does see a long-term upward trend for cryptocurrencies and discusses the abnormal inflationary period we're seeing now. He predicts that the U.S. is currently in a recession and will likely hit the worst part of it in the next quarter. He notes that the psychology of the market cycle is currently in the disbelief and depression phase, where people cannot believe the markets are rising despite the worsening economy. Pal also gives his take on the coming rate cuts and how this will affect not only the crypto and stock markets, but the central banks will play a major role in this cycle as well. Let's get right into the latest interview with Raul Pal. Before we dive in, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. It's a tremendous help for the growth of the channel and allows us to bring you more content just like this. There's a lot of noise on Twitter about the end of the world and all sorts of things. I think of this, what we're going through now, as a kind of normal business cycle recession. The only abnormal things were the inflation that was the direct opposite of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So as there was no supply of any goods and services, people came online, then we had the Russian crisis. It was a very rare occurrence. Yeah. And that led to the highest rate of change of interest rates, particularly in the United States, in all history. So it's a very extreme outcome. But generally speaking, it looks like a business cycle. And business cycles, rates go up, the economy slows down, we get a recession, and then it heals. Okay, fine. So that's kind of what I'm thinking. And I think Europe's lagging the US somewhat. So mm -hmm. I think we're probably in recession in the US it probably gets to the worst part of it in the next quarter. And then we probably start the recovery phase. But that takes a long time. And it's always when things feel worse is when the mm. bottom comes in. And Europe probably lags that somewhat. Um, it's slightly behind in the cycle, maybe three months behind. So we're at the end of the interest rate hike cycle because now we've broken the banking system again. And so we got to the end of the, uh, of the rate hike cycle. That's about to change. Europe will follow. Again, it's always later. Now, the psychology of the market cycle is uh, the, the chart you've just put up, always interesting. We are at the disbelief phase and depression phase. So this is where people can't believe the markets are rising because they know the economy is getting worse. Because the economy, what you're looking at is today's data. The macro world lives on forward looking. So you have to live in the future. So let's ask ourselves a simple question. Okay, there is a recession. We've broken Credit Suisse. We've broken Silicon Valley Bank. There's probably going to be a few more. What is the outcome? The outcome we know is a, with almost 100% certainty is rate cuts. And almost with 100% certainty is more monetary liquidity. Therefore, asset prices should start pricing in those things because the biggest driver of returns since 2008, when everything changed, has been the balance sheets of the central banks, liquidity. So if you take, I mean, I use the G5, the balance sheets of the G5. So that's the ECB, the Fed, the Bank of England, Bank of Japan, People's Bank of China. You make a composite of that and map the S&P 500 against it. 97.5% mm -hmm. correlation. It's basically wow. the same thing. When you look at that, you realize that now the S&P is basically a voting machine or a probability calculator to when is it coming and how big is it going to be in terms of liquidity. So that's why it's going up. Now, when it comes to assets, we know that certain assets do better mm -hmm. in liquidity environments. So European equities have never been great 
because there's not a lot of investors left in Europe. I mean, the average person, even their pension funds, tend to own more bonds than they own equities. So it's not a big investing culture, stock market culture. But the US is. What we find is that, generally speaking, the S&P 500 does pretty well. But gold does okay. Technology stocks do really well. And crypto does ridiculously well. Mm -hmm. And why is that? It's because economic growth is not high enough to sustain ongoing high equity prices, which is what's happened in Europe. In the US, it's optically looks like they're going higher, but it's actually to do with the reserve currency of the world being debased. So when you divide the S&P by the Fed balance sheet, it's gone nowhere. It looks like the European stock market. It's gone nowhere in no. 20 years. But crypto and technology do beat that debasement of currency. And it's because they're secular trends driven mm. by adoption of technologies. So they have a tailwind. While everything else is driven by an aging population that's massively in debt and an economy that's slow. I set up an asset management business called Exponential Age Asset Management that invests mm -hmm. in crypto hedge funds. And the reason is, is we know that individuals are coming into the space. So that's, you can own the underlying chains, you can own NFTs, all of that stuff. But we know the institutions are coming to invest as well. And we know a lot of them are interested in DeFi. But when I look at it, the hedge fund space in TradFi is $3 trillion. The hedge fund space in crypto is about $5 billion. Mm -hmm. So the reason you're seeing so much arbitrage opportunity is it's a function of not enough capital in the space. Yeah. Which is why when somebody blows up, it has huge knock-on effect. When three hours capital blows up, it has huge knock-on effect. So there's not enough capital in the space. That will disappear over time. I mean... Trust me, as soon as they can, every investment bank will trade the arbitrage as they always do. All of the hedge funds will. The market makers do already. And that's a good thing for DeFi. Even though, yes, the yields will come down, and etc. But you're basically putting risk-taking in the hands of risk-takers and diversifying out a bunch of, you know, 10,000 hedge funds that are yeah. all running, you know, billions of dollars. We have a much more robust DeFi system. Right yeah. now, DeFi is still a bit fragile. Powell notes that certain assets perform better in liquidity environments, such as U.S. equities, technology stocks, gold, and crypto. He believes this is because economic growth is not high enough to sustain ongoing high equity prices, and these assets have a tailwind from secular trends. He notes that while individuals are investing in crypto, institutions are also showing interest, particularly in decentralized finance. However, Powell shares that the hedge fund space in crypto is only about $5 billion, compared to the astronomical amount of $3 trillion in traditional finance. Powell believes that the cyclical pattern in cryptocurrency prices is influenced by monetary and liquidity cycles. He suggests that more investment from traditional finance will ultimately benefit decentralized finance by diversifying risk, taking, and creating a more robust system. What do you think about Raul Powell's prediction and outlook for crypto and how this cycle will change everything? Comment down below. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. This is Library of Wealth. We'll see you in the next video.